welcome uh, Pushpa and Raghu to this evening's event. I'm really delighted you accepted our invitation. As soon as one started reading about your publication in the press, I picked up the courage, my committee encouraged me and said that, yes, please do invite them and we would love to hear what they have to say about this rather grim, but extremely important event in the history of India. So I welcome you on behalf of the chairperson and the trustees of the CSMBS and the director general, Mr. Sabia Sachi Mukherjee, on behalf of my own committee, members of the Museum Society, our guests this evening, and of course myself. Thank you very, very much for so graciously accepting our invitation to hear, be here with us. I know you must be really busy after the launch of this book. And what a topic, what a topic, ladies and gentlemen. One man's fight for the truth about Jallianwala Bagh. It's such a grim period of our history. And I would like to say something about this to our members today. It is really the case that shook the empire. It's a historical narrative of the lives of men and women who lived through an era of colonial India. It recounts how despite British efforts to curtail news of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre to the borders of the Punjab and the atrocities committed in that province, one man ensured that it had escalated to becoming world news. It is a story of a people brutally subjugated to unimaginable cruelties, such as the forced recruitments and the daily humiliations of a subject people thrust under a sadistic martial law. It is a history of a man of power and position who was ready to forsake all his privileges to fight and ensure that no other Indian would ever, ever be subjected to such atrocities ever again. I have read the book, Pushpa and Raghu, and it has really moved me to anger, frustration, and tears. We are past midnight's children, I should say. We were not there to witness this terrible blot on our history. It is a story of one man's journey from a small village of Mankara in South Malabar to becoming the sole Indian representative on the Viceroy's Council. A lawyer by profession, Sir C. Shankaran Nair was fiercely patriotic, valued integrity and was unafraid of standing up against even the most powerful. This is the story of how Nair horrified that he has been a part of a government that had condoned the atrocities committed in the Punjab. He resigned from the Viceroy's Council without a moment's hesitation. He fearlessly held Sir Michael O'Dwyer, the then governor of the Punjab, personally responsible for the atrocities and the massacres at Jallianwala Bagh. The indignant O'Dwyer, refusing to accept the responsibility for his actions, instead asked Nair for an apology. Nair would not apologize for stating the truth. Finding that Sir Nair was unrelenting in his stance, Michael O'Dwyer sued Nair in the highest court of the British Empire, the court of the King's Bench in London. And Raghu is at Pashpa at pains to explain what exactly the King's Bench was in its hierarchy of law courts. The case that shook the empire is about this momentous case that received such wide press coverage that the unjust rule of the British in India they exposed for the world to see. It started off as a family history, as Raghu and Pushpa explained, and they were writing this for their two daughters, Divya and Nikhila, but realized that the subject would have been most appropriate to be discussed openly and the history shared with a larger audience, and hence this publication. A little bit about our speakers for this evening. Pushpa has been writing for over three decades, starting as a freelance journalist. She moved on to be a features editor for Mumbai for a staple of travel magazines and the sole representative for a Hong Kong-based travel industry newspaper. Currently, she writes 
for the luxury industry and has written several educational and books of general interest. Raghu, and by the way, we were mothers in the school where our children went there. So I have known Pushpa for about 35 years. So thank you Pushpa for being with us and sharing the platform with Raghu, an old friend who despite having a completely different career, we crossed paths again about 30 years ago because Raghu was passionate about, of all things, subjects that interest our society, heritage conservation. By career, Raghu is a banker and also a leading writer on banking, finance, and investments. He has been writing for major financial newspapers, magazines, and journals for the last four decades and has over 45 published books to his credits. This is not the first one. So kudos to you, Raghu. Raghu. These two writers of divergent genres, different styles, and a unique perspective have come together for the first time to write a story that brings alive a tumultuous era in Indian history. Thank you both very, very much for doing us this honor this evening. And before I hand you over to our very able technical team, what would we do without you? Ably led by Jason Johns, we have with us this evening, Aishwarya, Mrinalini, Sanjana, and Yashraj. So thank you so much, tech team. You have done a lot for us. You teach us with every event how to improve ourselves. So thank you. And now I hand you over to the tech team and tech team, you have a video with you. Will you please start playing that? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And I won't say enjoy the evening, but it will give you ample opportunity to reflect on what this nation and its people have been through. So thank you very, very much. And a warm welcome to everyone here this evening. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the Museum Society of Mumbai and CSMBS for graciously inviting us to present our book and talk to you about the case that shook the, the empire. I would also like to thank Firoza for the wonderful introduction that she gave us. And of course, Jason Johns for all the technical assistance this evening. I would also like to thank Mudit Jain for facilitating the, this opportunity. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here. My name is Raghu Palat and this is my wife Pushpa and we co-authored this book. Good evening, I'm Pushpa as he told you uh, and we're delighted, absolutely delighted to come here today and we're very very grateful to all of you who've come today. Thank you for coming and listening to us. Could we have the first slide, please? 
This is, this is the book uh, that we co-authored. It's called The Case That Should Be Empire. You have the cover. That's the basic cover on it. Um, you can remove the slide now. Now I'm going to start right at the beginning as to when we, how we got about writing this book. Well, actually, we were, went on holiday to Amritsar and we saw the beautiful, beautiful Golden Temple. Uh, any, any of you who have seen it will agree with me. It's absolutely exquisite. But en route to the temple, you can't miss the Jallianwala Bagh Museum. Now, this uh, Raghu is a huge, huge history buff. Uh, not so much me, but Raghu is a Could huge... Could I have the next slide, no, please? No, just it's okay. Uh, uh, he, he's a huge, huge history buff. And um, oh, if he sees a stone, a rock, or anything, a tree stump that has any historical value, uh, Raghu will be there at least for half an hour. So obviously, when we went past the Jallianwala Bagh Museum, then uh, he had to go in. So that's the, a shot of the. Can we just so see could we have the next slide? Please? Picture of the Jallianwala Bagh Museum. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So that's the museum. It's quite you can't really miss it actually. So yes. So we walked into the museum. We walked through the grounds. The next. We could have the next slide. Yeah, these are the grounds. Uh, fairly well maintained. Not you know, it's fairly well maintained. Then we moved on and we saw the well, the infamous Could have well, the next slide. where uh, so many people had jumped and killed themselves. And then there was the wall, which was riddled and the with next bullet slide. marks as people tried to climb over it to save themselves. So it, this is what is out in the grounds. And then we moved into you could the remove museum. These slides now. Then we moved into the museum. There are several exhibits there. So we were looking at these exhibits and uh, while we were looking at it, uh, I, found, I found a plaque, a plaque commemorating uh, Raghu's great grandfather, the uh, Sarsi Shankaran Nair, the uh, protagonist of our book. So obviously I was very, very excited. Um, you know, it's Raghu's great grandfather. So I called him and I said, come on, you just look, 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 they've uh, put up a big plaque here honoring your great grandfather. When, when she showed it to me, I was really surprised because here yeah, was this fabulous plaque you know, uh, honoring my gra great grandfather, and then Pushpa said, "No, no, <laughs> let's take a photograph of you next to it." I was feeling a little cagey and feeling very little, very embarrassed because there were so many other people around, and of course there were these signs saying, "No photos," as we see in a lot of our museums. And there was a policeman hovering around, so I was a little. Okay, yeah, know. yeah, he's always very shaky, very, <laughs> very stiff and upper lip kind of thing, stiff upper lip kind of thing. So I went up, I said, no, no, don't worry. I went to the policeman and I said, you know what, uh, you know, that, that plaque, it honors his great grandfather. Can we take a picture uh, with him standing next to it? Uh, you know, the policeman was really sweet. He said, take as many as you want. But if you notice, that picture's not here because Raghu is still not allowing that picture to be shown. So it's not going to be shown. But anyway, so that I think was the first time that Raghu even thought of his great grandfather. Yes? Yes, that's absolutely true. You know, because here, you know, seeing him honored in the Punjab, a person from Kerala, while, you know, people in Kerala really didn't know much about him, I was really astonished and flabbergasted and, of course, delighted. You know, when I talk about people in Kerala not knowing him, uh, later on when our book was being reviewed, some, uh, you know, one of the Malayalam papers, it said, Malayalam Maranda Malayali, which meant, which means the Malayali, the Malayali, Malaya, Malayali is had forgotten. Uh, but forget, uh, you know, Kerala, Kerala, it's, I'm his great grandson. I didn't know much about him. True, you know, when I was growing up, my grand, I'd heard stories about him by my grandfather, who was his son my grandmother and my dad. And they were stories about his achievements and they were spoken about him with a lot of awe and respect. But as far as I was concerned, these were family stories. I didn't really pay much heed to them. But now seeing how he was honored in the Punjab and seeing this huge plaque, I said, I need to know more, not only for myself, but for my children, as uh, Piroza mentioned, uh, Divya and Nikila, and we have a little granddaughter called Nivaya. It is important that they knew their familial history. So I started writing about him and reading about him. And as I read, there was so much information. So I said, let me write. And I wrote. And by the time I finished writing, I realized that it was because of him 
and the case that he fought in the court of the king's bench, that people came to know, the world came to know about the atrocities, the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh, and the tremendous atrocities that were committed during uh, martial law in the Punjab. It was because of the case, the case that shook the empire, the case that he fought, that people came to know about it. And that is really what set us. Yeah, in. so he had written quite a bit. He had, and, it was a longish article. It was quite a long article. And I went through it because he kindly let me see what I it. show her all my articles. <laughs> okay. <and she> <laughs> so I went through it <laughs> and it was a, a detailed article. And what struck me is that nobody knows this story. And this story needs telling. It was a case fought by one individual against a huge empire. Huh? And it ha I felt, yes, okay, our children should know, our grandchildren should know, that's fine. But it's a story that the rest of us also should know about. I mean, Raghu didn't know how, uh, you know, how this case had brought to highlighted uh, details of Shanjali and Walabag, and now he knew it. But I felt there was a story for a wider readership, for a wider audience. And so I said, Raghu, let's, let's do a little more research and let's, you know, write something, maybe a small book or something. Let's just research more and write more. Um, that's how we started uh, uh, coordinating and you know, that's how you know, we decided to work on this, uh, this project. But to say that you should write a book and it's easier said than done and to collaborate with Raghu isn't the easiest because <laughs> I feel I write much better. I write better. <laughs> he automatically he is, he writes better. So it's quite a difficult, difficult, difficult task. But so actually what happened is that we both wrote books. So they've you know, written two, two, mm -hmm. uh, two books on the same subject. And, you know, uh, initially there was a tussle. Yes. Then uh, uh, what happened was that we began to have one goal. And that goal was that we want to make uh, create a book that was absolutely factual, based only on facts. OK, even the conversations in the book are based on fact. OK, so we wanted a book that was entirely factual, yet we wanted it to read like a story. So, well, Raghu, like I said, was a huge history buff. But there are people like me who don't, you know, delve into history this much. So therefore, uh, but I do like a uh, good story and so do a lot of others. So I said, we, uh, you know, we decided that we'd make it into a historical novel so that there would be a story which could interest a larger audience and the message would get conveyed. The story would be conveyed as well as for historians. There was all the facts. So this is how we uh, decided. But this again is easier said than done because like Feroza told you, Raghu writes what wrote 45 books, but all on finance, taxation and boring stuff like that. And I write all about the fun stuff, lifestyle, luxury, travel, leisure, and that kind of stuff. So two people from two completely different genres were attempting a genre which neither of us had any clue of, of how to write. So this is what we did. Uh, it wasn't easy. But it, like I said, with a common goal, we managed this and that's how we've written this and, and I think we complemented each other because as Pushpa mentioned, I like to do the boring things like research, which I enjoy. <laughs> and she brings the, the writing to life. And when we, when, I, when we said we wanted a balanced book which gave every side of the picture, I must tell you that we did a huge amount of research. We looked at, at it from a British point of view. And in that, I read Ian Colvin's The Life of General Dyer, where General Dyer, General Dyer had been, you know, fated as the savior of the British Empire. I read Edwin Montague's My Indian Diary, where Edwin Montague was the Secretary of State for India. I read Sir Michael O'Dwyer, who was the Lieutenant Governor of the Punjab, his book, My, you know, My India as I Knew It. Then I read parliamentary proceedings because this was discussed even in the House of Commons. So I read parliamentary proceedings. Congress report. The Congress report and the Hunter Commission report, which was a detailed, uh, you know, probe into what had actually happened. And then there were there were books by his sons-in-law, Sir Shankaran's sons-in-law, uh, separately, Sir C. Madhavan Nair and KPS Menon, who was a former ambassador to Russia, and Sir Madhavan Nair used to be a, 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 a privy councillor. And 
And then fortunately, because the case was so important, there was, you know, the, the case was covered. covered by newspapers every single day. And that is from April 30th, 1924 to June 7th, 1924, five and a half weeks. It was the longest civil case in history at that time. And it was covered by the Ta London Times in India, by the Times of India, by the Hindu and all other kinds of papers. It was covered everywhere in the Commonwealth. It was covered in Canada, in Australia, in Jamaica, in Singapore. And we managed to get excerpts and, uh, you know, and uh, cuttings from all these areas. So we were able to do a tremendous amount of research and there was so much information about about the case that he fought and also what had occurred in the Punjab. And it was all because of this case. Not only that, we also tried to make sure that, you know, we wanted to show each person as a human being with their frailties and with their strengths. Yeah, and I must add, Raghu is a Libra, so it's very, he's always balancing things. He's always wanting to see the other side. There must be other. So that also was a... <laughs> Uh, yeah. a part of, you know, he played a part that way too. Yeah. So, so we, so as far as Sir Shankaran was concerned. Yeah, so I give you the bad parts, okay? We've, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he can flatter his great grandfather as much as he wants. Now, firstly, he was stubborn. He was short tempered. Uh, he likes to get his own way. He, uh, once he had a bee in his bonnet, he just went after it and with it like a dog with a bone and just would not let go. Then uh, if he had an opponent who had a different opinion, he used to shout louder and louder and louder, thinking, I mean, I don't know what he thought. Maybe he thought that the loudest shouter wins the, the argument, but this was his, his manner. He was always also very distant. Maybe I should do that, shout you. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was also very distant from his children. He was very close to his wife. He was really close to his wife. But his children, uh, you know, respected him but that for you know that closeness and he was fond of his children but he just wasn't close to them he was a very principled man i must say that and he was a very religious man not only with regard to the hindu scriptures he read all the scriptures uh, all the texts and even you know uh, when he was you know almost dying he was still studying pali to uh, study the buddhist text in pali so that is there now you can flatter it now <laughs> not going to flatter him, I'm going to say <laughs> the, the kind of person he was, which was, he was a nationalist. And he really believed that Indians should be given more responsibility to govern themselves. And he wanted to do it in a constitutional manner by the passing of laws, because the law was his passion. As Pushpa mentioned, he had very clear ideas about what was right or wrong. And once he had made up his mind on what was the way to go, nothing could change. So whenever there was a uh, whenever there was a proposal in the in the viceroy's executive council and he did not agree, threats, intimidations, nothing would change it. And if they wanted to push their power, their proposal through, he would immediately write a minute of dissent. And his minutes of dissent were are very famous, and he would ensure that that was also sent to London so that they, the, the Secretary of State would be able to see the concerns that Sir Shankaran had. He was a good friend and he would stick by his friends in time of difficulty like the Hindu newspaper had a lot of problems at one time and he stood by them. And as I mentioned, you know, if he felt something was being done, which was incorrect, he would, irrespective of who it was, stick by it. In, when he was a, when he had just become a wakil in the Madras High Court, the other Indian wakils decided to stage a strike against the English barristers because they didn't like the manner they were being treated. Should we show the slide of him as a wakil? At the so we'll come to that. So what he did at that time was. He says, no, he said, I feel that a client has the right to choose the, the, the wakil or the lawyer of his choice. And he did not join the other Indian wakils. And this made him very unpopular, but this did not matter to him. He, he stuck by his principles. And so when, I'm, when we say 
but Doctor, you know, but uh, Sir Shankaran, I, I should, you know, when I, I since I've just spoken about his law, law, I should let me tell you a little about him. After his education, after his education in South Malabar, his schooling, he went on to the Madras Presidency College, and from there on to the Law College. Could we have the next slide, please? That's it. That, that, that's, that's it. it. And in the, in, you know, and, and after, and he was made, a, he was the first Indian Attorney General of the Madras High Court. In 40, in, 80, sorry, in 1897, and that is the, that's the picture of him in 1897, he was the first, pre, he was a president of the Indian National Congress. The, the first and only Malayali to have that, to held that honor. In 1908, he was made a judge of the Madras High Court, and he passed some very momentous judgments, including the including a judgment on inter-caste marriage. Can we have the next slide? In 1914, uh, Viceroy uh, Lord Harding, who is the Viceroy of India invited him to, to become a member of his executive council. And that is the that is him dressed as a member of the of the executive council. He was given some, some very important portfolios, law, education, and lands. And he is actually responsible for saving Calcutta University. And he was involved in the establishment of the Benares Hindu University. When Lord Harding was asked why he had chosen Sir Shankaran, his reply was, I have chosen the ablest Indian that I know. And during that time, well, especially during the time of the Montague Chelmsford reforms, when Montague came, the, the secretary of the, uh, of the Indian National Congress, Ramaswamy Iyer, mentioned to him that if you want any reforms, Past, you need to get Sir Shankaran's approval because he was the most powerful Indian of his time. And without his nod, nothing would go through. He was in such an exalted position. And as you appreciate, the Viceroy's Executive Council was the highest ruling body in British India and uh, equivalent of the, the Union Cabinet. And it was in this in this August body that he fought for the rights of Indians whenever he could. He had very uh, important portfolios. Also. Yes, I had mentioned that. Okay. So, do you want to take this slide? Yes, you could take. Them. So he was in this central body. We can. You could take this. You move this slide. Yes. So he was in this uh, uh, viceroy's council. Like Rambu said, it's like having said being part of the central government, and yet he didn't know of the atrocities in the Punjab or of the massacre. This was because in those times, communication was very difficult. It was very slow. What was it? Letters, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe telegrams or people going through. Now here, there was press censorship firstly, before the, um, before, uh, the massacre. After the massacre, the Indian papers were completely banned. There was one English paper which was circulating literally in British propaganda. So there was no information getting out of Punjab borders. So this is why... Being in the central uh, body of the government, he had no clue of what was happening. However, after the massacre, slowly news slowly started. The news started trickling, trickling down. down. And, and when he heard of it, he was so horrified. As Piroza had mentioned to you earlier, he was you know he just didn't want to be part of this kind of government. He couldn't believe that he was a part of a government that had condoned such. Brutality, such a terrible massacre. It was too shocking for him, and he wanted to resign. Yes, yes he said, if 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 a government like this can condone it, then this country is not worth what living in. Yes. You know, he actually said that, and he was so upset that he said, "I will not be part of this government," and he wanted to resign. And when he made his intent known, because he told everybody, "I am going to resign from this government," when he made his intent known, several people, several very, very important people, Motilal Nehru, 
the father of our late Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, Dr. Annie Besant, and Father Andrews, a friend of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, they went up to Simla and pleaded with him not to resign because he was the only voice safeguarding the interests of Indians in the Viceroy's Executive Council. But Sir Nair, as I, you know, he was very adamant. But after a huge amount of hoaxing, he said he would defer his uh, decision provided Father Andrews went to Lahore and, and, the, and the Punjab and found out what had actually occurred. Father Andrews agreed, went to Lord Chelmsford, got permission to go to the Punjab and then took a train to Lahore. But on his way, as he reached the borders of the Punjab, he was stopped and turned back. And when he was turned back, he came back to Sanayar and said, I will not stand in your way. At which time Sanaya said, I will now promptly resign. And he resigned. Now we'd like to read a small so paragraph to you in regard to his resignation. Yeah. Let me get it out. Yeah. All right. Once they had both settled into their chairs, Lord Chelmsford politely expressed his regret on receiving Sanaya's resignation. Then, with no real interest in Sir Nair's opinion, but with typical British courtesy, the Viceroy inquired whether Sir Nair could suggest someone as a successor. Sir Nair, sensing the Viceroy's disinterest and unconcern for anything an Indian had to suggest, found it hard to resist one last dig. Looking directly at the Viceroy and speaking in a solemn tone, as though he had given this matter very serious thought, he said. Yes. And pointed to the turbaned, red and gold reliveried Pion, standing ramrod straight by the giant doorway. That man there, Ram Prashad. Lord Jemsford almost shot out of his chair. I replied. Why not? He is tall, he is handsome, he wears his livery well, and he will say yes to whatever you say. Altogether, he will make an ideal member of council. Leaving the Viceroy speechless, Sanaya warmly shook his hand and quietly exited the chambers. Do so you have a sense of humor too, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So one of the questions... Uh... Then you see what happens is, now he resigned. Now, when we've spoken at other events and a lot of the audience has come up and said, All right, he's resigned. Big deal. Why didn't he uh, also give up his title? Now, this has to be explained to you that everybody who became a judge re received the word was knighted and became sir. Okay, they've got this title. So the title was basically uh, a recognition of his professional prowess. Now, Shankar and I, if you read the book, you will realize that uh, law was his passion. This is the one thing he really believed in. Till the day he died, he believed it, that you must follow the law, that any change should take place legally. So this was his passion and this was his profession. So getting the title was to deal with his profession. And by giving up a personal title, uh, he was just saying that, okay, I don't want a professional acknowledgement of my prowess. However, when he resigns from the, and that made no, it wouldn't have had any impact, but because that was just a personal thing. But when he resigned from the Viceroy's Council, from the central government, with a very important position. He was actually voicing his dissent. He was clearly showing his disgust with the government. He was clearly announcing that I don't want to have to do anything with this government. That was a huge statement. And not many people in that position and power would have had the guts to do it. But he just did it overnight, literally overnight. A little bit he had to wait till uh, he got uh, you know far out the, uh, the response from Punjab, but he was ready to give it over, and he did give it up. There was position, his power, everything. He was overnight. Absolutely, and, and and it had a, the, the, the tremendous impact within it three impact within three wanted. days. Within three days, press censorship in the Punjab was lifted. Within two weeks, martial law was scrapped, and. The fact that he had stepped down from a position of such power and authority and uh, position, the Viceroy's Executive Council, 
had reverberated through not only India, but in the halls of parliament in England. And they question why would a person do this? Because it's, ne it's never been done to the extent that the Hunter Commission was instituted under Lord William Hunter to find out exactly what had actually occurred in the Punjab. But as I said, by, he resigned from the government because he was dis disgusted with his government. He still believed in fighting for the rights of Indians. And so he, uh, the, the Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montague, invited him to join his council, which is the Secretary of State to, of State for India's council in London. And Sana, as uh, Shankaran felt, he would be able to help. Yes, but I must tell you this, the British were so petty. When you're invited on these, uh, to, to represent a particular community or you're invited, your fare is usually paid. But yes. the Viceroy, yes. being as petty as he could be, refused to pay. But Sanayar was determined to represent India and he went and he, uh, on his own, you know, using his own funds and he went there and spoke on behalf of him. And he was able to make a difference and after a few years, he returned to India. Yeah, so he returned to India. He was still working for the people. He was still uh, very active. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, he also wrote a book, a book called Gandhi and Anarchy. Now, this was a conversation with Mahatma, with Gandhiji. Uh, in those days, you could have conversations. You could defer in your opinion and not make an enemy of the person. Today, it's a little different. Uh, if people don't agree, they seem to you know hate each other for the rest of their lives. But this was a conversation with uh, Mahatma Gandhi because he did not, Sir Nair did not believe in civil disobedience. His passion, as I said, he believed in the law. So he felt with civil disobedience, uh, if it was encouraged, then uh, when India formed its own government, it would have problems with the people who had got ha gotten habituated to civil disobedience. They would not be abiding by the law. So it would be difficult to govern. That was his point of view. And he expressed it in the book. But in this book, uh, he also had one line, just one line, which put the responsibility of the massacre at Jallianwala Bab on Sir Michael O'Dwyer. Now, by this time, uh, the Michael O'Dwyer, who was, had gone back to England, he had lost his... Uh, he had been the governor of Punjab. And he, yes, because he was the governor of Punjab, uh, Sir Nair felt that he was the final responsibility. Without his say-so, General Dyer could never have done what he did. Okay, So he felt that the person in charge must be held responsible for the massacre. Now, uh, but Michael O'Dwyer, by that was, uh, you know, um, uh, had lost his reputation, he had lost his position, his, you know. Absolutely. And yeah. he was really like, licking his wounds because uh, now, you know, uh, people were not uh, speaking very well about him. When, now, just there were just. And he was desperately trying to get back to his Yes, he was. And there were just three books sent to the UK. One was sent by a friend to Michael O'Dwyer, right? The other two were sent by Sir Shankaran himself to the Secretary of State's uh, office. One was sent directly to Michael O'Dwyer, and Michael O'Dwyer, as we said, was trying was trying to salvage his reputation. So uh, he decided, okay, I will uh, ask uh, Sir Nair to uh, apologize. Now he was a. Uh, we know that Sir, we, by this time we realized that Sir Nair is very headstrong and adamant, and he believed he said this, and it was actually a fact that the governor has to be held responsible for something that's happened in his state. So uh, he refused to take the statement and, you know, and not only that, Michael O'Dwyer wanted him to apologize and pay a thousand rupees to certain thousand charities. Thousand pounds. Thousand pounds, sorry. Thousand pounds to certain charities. Yes. But Sanar outright refused. He would not do it. So Michael O'Dwyer, Dwyer being very wily, he filed a defamation case against Sanar, not in India, but in the UK. And that took the highest box, the King's bench. Okay. Now, this meant that whereas Michael O'Dwyer would have an English judge, an English jury, an English people in the courtroom, and also have his witnesses come in with all their medals and uniform and looking very grand and stand in the witness box and give uh, their testimonies, Sir Nair, he had people like farmers, traders, 
poor people who couldn't even imagine thinking of go i mean of uh, going to the uk there was no way that he could they didn't even, even know english they, they, yeah. couldn't, they couldn't have even testified, testified in, in front of a jury. jury but what happens is that what they did is they took uh, uh, depositions from these people and there are horrific accounts really horrific accounts and these came to be uh, publicized during the case okay and uh, they took thousands and thousands of depositions people have made their statements and explained their uh, the situation that they had to go through but the english judge in all his wisdom said allowed only 125 depositions and now here are depositions being read okay read out and here uh, on the other hand were these very important dignitaries coming and supporting some actual right there was a big difference but that's how it was that's how the case was to be fought however the case was absolutely yes but, uh, no, but, yeah, but before what, that, what i need yeah. what i need to say, yes. talk about is the, the what was the what case was about what, yes now if if you if you go to the next slide you will see the 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 person who perpetrated the jallianwala bag massacre this is brigadier general dyer and can we have the next slide also please oh, next the next slide yeah. this is the massacre. massacre which occurred at jallianwala now to tell you what the what, what the atrocities were was you can remove the slide was that uh, when the first world war was declared sir michael o'dwyer uh, to prove his uh, loyalty and his capability to king and country decided that he would recruit as many people from the punjab as he could now the people in the punjab were really not interested in going to france and going to europe to fight a war which they had no stake in which they didn't understand or identify so they no one joined the army so in order to force them he did horrific things each village was given a quota of persons to recruit and if they did not fulfill that quota that village was blacklisted. they are blacklisted as a criminal tribe their titles were taken off not only theirs but it was also deemed that no descendant or anyone in that village could have a title or or position of power or a or a, or a job we were night raids were held and people were carted away to join the army when people heard about these raids they ran away from the villages their women were stripped and made to sit on thorny bramble bushes until their men came back recruitment the recruiting agents were hired in order to recruit pia to recruit people for a commission criminals were let out of jail provided they joined the army and there were many i'm just recounting a few of them there were many many more things that they did then shortly after the massacre martial law could we have the next slide please Can we have the next slide? Yeah. This is a picture of Lord Chelmsford, who was the viceroy at that point of time, and this is Edwin Montague, the the Secretary of State for India. Could we have the next slide? Two days after the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, martial law was declared in the Punjab. And let me tell you what the martial law involved. You could remove the slide now. what the martial law involved shortly about 2 3 days after martial law was instituted a few people had gathered together in the small town of gujranwala in order to disperse them sir michael o'dwyer sent a plane with soldiers with machine guns and with bombs and these and these bombs were were haphazardly thrown on buildings and it was students thrown on a students hostel killing several of them it was thrown on children playing in the fields it was, it was farmers returning from the fields uh, from their days labor were shot in total about several hundred people were killed in this exercise then in lahore 
students were made to march 20 miles every single day to in the hot blistering lahore sun to mark their attendance school children were whipped to to uh, to make an example then every indian was required to salam uh, salam the, the uh, british uh, and if the salam was you know it was one of those sweeping salams which they had to do and if they did not do it in the way it was, they felt was right they were either whipped or incarcerated in one instance an indian was made to kiss the boots of an englishman because that englishman had not seen the indian salaming him no indian was allowed to ride in front of an englishman and if he was on a horse he had to come down after uh, or worse than that there were people there you know wealthy not wealthy but learned people and people of some standing, standing were humiliated lawyers were made to act as chaprasis and coolies. and coolies and bring chairs for englishmen whereas the coolies themselves were not asked to do this and these were some in some cases 65 and 70 year old learned lawyers and you know people of some standing and the and the worst i think was the crawling order and i think i'll and we'll just read an excerpt of that also from our book here Dyer explained that the order only entailed practices that were familiar to the natives. His unbridled contempt for Indians was apparent in his explanation to a British inspector. Some Indians crawl face downwards in front of their gods. I wanted them to know that a British woman is as sacred as a Hindu god. Therefore, they have to crawl in front of her too. The lane down which Indians were made to crawl was approximately 150 to 200 yards in length, as well as narrow and crowded. There were several two-storied houses on either side, and many more homes in the alleyways and by lanes that branched off it. The people living in this locality would necessarily have to use the crawling lane if they stepped out. The crawling order applied to every person who used this lane. No exceptions were permitted, even if it was for a medical emergency. What Dyer referred to as going on all fours meant that the men had to crawl the length of the lane flat on their bellies. If they lifted their knees or bent their body in any way to relieve the pain, the police would immediately dig their rifle butts into the backs of the transgressors and force them back into the reptile position. The order was strictly enforced by the police from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Additionally, from 15 April, the hours of the curfew were also extended up to 10 p.m. When asked for a justification for the timings, Dyer dismissively retorted, they could believe it all other times. What he conveniently omitted to mention was that should they do so, they would be breaking the curfew order enforced between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., for which they could be shot dead. So yes, uh, these were the, the, the horrific uh, cruelties that the Indians had to go through and, uh, you know, uh, there, there have been readers from the Punjab who actually have uh, yep. called us and written to us and said that uh, they, couldn't they, must, read they couldn't read those passages because they were so emotionally uh, disturbed, uh, you know, that their ancestors had to go through this. And, you know, we have been saying that news didn't trickle through. Even families were too ashamed to let their uh, children know the kind of humiliation that they had been subjected to show the picture of the, the yeah if you could just go to next. go to the next slide please see 
Yeah. This kind of humiliation is difficult for anybody to try and explain to the, you know, they don't want to do this. So yes, there were all this. And this case brought out uh, this uh, all this out. So obviously it was a sensational case. It was like a David and Goliath case. You can take the slide off. Yeah. Uh, it was a David and, and it- You can take the, the slide the, off. The, 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 the courts were packed, packed to capacity and beyond capacity. There were people standing. There were Rajas and Maharajas. Absolutely, the yes, the Raja, the Maharaja of Baroda, uh, there was several other Rajas. Oh, they didn't get space. So they sat with the judge. With the judge. They sat with the judge. So there just wasn't space. So obviously the press was, you know, uh, lapping this up. They they just reported daily. And uh, there were reporters all the time there. But the thing was, communication, as you know, is difficult. It was by telegraphs, you know. And every day they had to rush off after court and send these telegraphs off. But yet the case was reported across the world by every single newspaper. And now all of a sudden, what... Uh, but uh, the British had tried to keep within the borders of Punjab, spread not just within India, but across the globe. And that is why you find so much information about Jallianwala above. Whereas there were other atrocities, but there's no information because here was a man who took this up as a, as a child. He wanted everybody to know that the British was certainly not just a fair in there in their administration and their treatment of their subjects. So yes, it, this became sensational. Every paper reported and very beneficial to us because yes. we had so much. We were able to get the actual papers of, of that period, which is still available. And we were surprised that it was even, poor, you know, it was reported even in places like Jamaica yes. and Singapore and very and all over the world. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, that. that's basically, yeah. now what has happened is that, yes, the case was very, very, do you want to say something else on that? Yeah. So then uh, there was, um, the case is really sensational and because the case is so sensational, we're not going to tell you much about the case, we'd like you to read it. And I think uh, uh, Karan Johar's company, uh, Dharma Productions, uh, enjoyed the case as well, right? Yes. Yes. So, so uh, they are doing. A, we've been fortunate that they've been doing. They're going to do a movie yeah. on uh, this, and uh, the the director is uh, a very young. Uh, then, yes. So there are some slides. Pictures. Oh yeah. Did you want to show the slides? The next yes. few slides. Yes. Can we show the next few slides, so please? That, yeah. Just, just to give you an idea. Idea of what was happening. This is a picture of, of the judge of the of the Michael O'Dwyer. Sorry, Michael O'Dwyer. The, the Michael O'Dwyer. The next, please. That's the. Uh, in the next slide, this is the court of the King's Bench in London, where the case was tried. And now the judge. And the next is the judge. Next is the judge. The next picture is the judge, Sir, Sir Justice Henry a very McCarty. Very partial, bigoted a judge. Very partial, bigoted judge. Yes, and he tried the case. The uh, jury was all British. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so, therefore, anyway, the case is very exciting. And uh, uh, it was picked up, as I said, by Dharma Productions, who are going to get yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll a movie, movie on that. And uh, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, it's uh, being directed by a young uh, director, Karan Tyagi. Yeah. Who is who is incidentally also a, a lawyer? Uh, he Harvard studied Harvard. at Harvard Law College. Yes. So, so it, we, we believe that it will get the kind of attention and and, and it's and it's detail. very it was very exciting for us that it's being. You know, uh, taken on as a movie because a book has, uh, yes, certainly has a reach, but a movie has a far wider reach, and this story will get a wider audience. So we're very grateful for, for that. So I hope all goes well with that. And uh, we've moved on. We've uh, written our next uh, book, uh, which has been uh, which has been taken on by a Penguin, which should be out uh, next year. It's and about a uh, uh, um, very strong, a, a woman. very strong woman who also took on the British. Yes, it is. It is. Um, so we're trying to bring out little known historical yes, because we, happenings in India. Fortunately, and there is a uh, an audience for that. They want to know more about Indian history and not as the British have written it for us, but as Indians are representing their own voice. And that is very important. There are movies, there are books, everything has a you know an audience now because people are interested. And I think it's really important that Indians now rewrite Indian history because otherwise, you know, we are we are reading it from the British uh, point of view, which is to an extent uh, biased, not to an extent very biased. Right. 
So now we'll open it up wherever yes. you want.